So I'm going to talk about uh, two things we've been working on with respect to visual pre-training, uh, in particular for usage with LLMs. So for motivation, there's been a lot of progress with uh, augmenting language models with vision. And so here's a few results from some work we did with our colleagues in the States. Um, this is the um, Parley model, and it can do some uh, things like captioning and VQA. So for example, some basic captioning. Uh, Parley says two helicopters are flying in the sky and one has a yellow stripe on the tail. So it's sort of accurate and gives a little bit of detail. Parley can also do captioning in multiple languages. And uh, you can just take my word for it that the captioning is decent uh, here. Maybe someone can verify that or not. And it can also um, answer questions about images. So how fast could you travel on this? To answer 500 miles per hour, the model is to understand the question and integrate it with a little bit of world knowledge to come up with a sort of reasonable-ish answer. So this is quite nice and shows the model's working. Um, these examples are not uh, with high probability in, in the training set uh, because we deduplicated it, uh, but they can be considered fairly in distribution. You know, these are standard test examples from the various sort of VLM evaluation suites. So how do they work, for example, out of distribution? And this image is out of distribution. First, it kind of looks out of distribution, uh, but secondly, the model that was used to generate this image, this one happens to come from Imagine, was trained after the training scrape was done for Parley, so this image wasn't floating around at the internet at, at that stage. And so when presented with this image, uh, we can also get a reasonable caption, uh, a dog laying in a house made of sushi. We can probe the image a little bit just to check it can decompose things correctly. What is the breed of dog? Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Is it correct? I don't know. It's a generated image, uh, but it seems kind of sensible. And uh, what's the breed of fish? Salmon. So it's not thrown by, you know, weird context and this, this kind of thing. Um, a, a slightly more recent version of Parley that we just published, Parley X, that's a similar thing, and uh, as the title of the paper suggests, basically a bit bigger, uh, can do things like chart understanding, um, infographic understanding, document OCR counting. So, for example, you know, how many $1 coins are there? It, it can you know, do this, this kind of counting task. Uh, an example of OCR, you know, what is written inside the box? Dr. Strange loves secret uses of Uranus and various other. Uh, so, you know, it can do OCR even when it's a little bit difficult case like this and, you know, integrate that with a bit with the, the VQA. Another thing one could do with these models, so as with language models, if one wants to adapt it to a new task, one doesn't necessarily have to fine tune, but one can provide a very small data set uh, as the context um, and do in, in context learning. So this is uh, a few shot in context example. This particular task is completely artificial. I'm not sure there's anyone would actually want to do this task, but it's more to demonstrate a little bit uh, the model's ability to use its context. So the task is to caption the image describing the population of the country from which the image was taken in the language of the country. So you know, one training example is the current population of Australia is 26 million people. We pack three examples into one sequence and show a picture of the Eiffel Tower, uh, and we get the following. So you know, indeed, the, the model has, you know, can do similar tricks that the sort of pure language models can do, but also using vision and, and multilingual and such. Um, as, as mentioned before, a lot of things can be framed as a sort of language or a pseudo language, including object detection, uh, where one can sort of serialize one's boxes into a fake language and then again treat that as a, as a, a vision language task. So one can uh, do object detection with the Parley model. So here's one example. Uh, when you prompt the model with detect knife and left half of watermelon and right half of watermelon, etc., uh, then you get some reasonable detections. Those who are watching carefully might nitpick and say that left hand and right hand could be detected in the other way around. But if we're getting down to that amount of detail regarding the point of reference, then the model's doing quite well. 
Um, it can also do, you know, if you detect this is paradise, right, it'll put a box around this is paradise. Uh, that's sort of the best thing you can do with that image. So it uh, can sort of uh, combine the detection and OCR capabilities. And there's no multilingual detection data, at least in our training set. And so one gets multilingual detection uh, coming out of the model as well. So, you know, these capabilities are driven by many factors, but one of the major drivers of performance has been scalability on the visual side. So there's an awful lot of focus on scaling language models and relatively little on scaling vision models, but um, it's also very important for performance. And so in this bar plot, we have uh, three models from the same class presented. The blue is the Pali 3 billion model that's been normalized to a score of zero across uh, these sort of standard benchmark tasks. And this consists of a 2 billion parameter vision model and a 1 billion parameter language model. Now, if one massively grows the model uh, by changing the 1 billion parameter model into a 13 billion parameter model, so overall 5x larger model, then one gets plus three points of performance, which is you know, quite substantial on these benchmarks, tasks like VQA, V2, cocoa captioning. You know, these are sort of towards their upper limit of performance, and so you know, each point can account. Um, but then when we go from 15 to 17, which is only plus 13% model size overall, but we put all those 2 billion extra parameters into the vision model, then we get a larger increase again than that huge increase in the language model size. So this sort of scaling things to be in proportion seems to be very important. And you know, this is not really the standard design. So Flamingo is quite a well-known visual language model. And you know, less than 1% of the model's capacity is dedicated to vision. If you include the perceiver resampler, it goes up to about 1%, whereas Pali 17B is about one quarter vision. Um, this doesn't saturate in Pali X. This actually uses a model that we've written about in this paper that's a um, 22 billion parameter. Uh, vision transformer that took some, you know, a bit of tricks to, to, to train, which, which are in the paper, and, you know, performance goes up, up again. And so, you know, we're not near saturated yet on the vision side. So that's the motivation, and with that in mind, I'm going to present two methods to improve the efficiency, generalization, and the scalability of vision models. While I've motivated it as, you know, what we want to do is go to large scale, we're at Google, actually these methods are also applicable at small scale. Um, so I think these can be uh, valuable for, for training you know, smaller vision models as well. First is patch and pack, and the second is soft mixture of experts. So the first one, patch and pack, a vision transform for any aspect ratio and resolution. So the pre-processing pipeline for vision, for most vision models, looks the same. You take your images that come in whatever aspect ratio and size they come in, and resize them mostly to 224 by 224 pixels. And this has basically been how it's done for the last 10 years. And this makes sense because you want to batch your images together. And in order to do this efficiently with a convolution neural, ne neural network, you need your, your images to be the same size. But it has some fairly intuitive downsides. Firstly, not all images naturally come square. Some do, but most don't. Uh, and so you either uh, lose the aspect ratio, which is probably useful information, or you have to like crop your image or pad it, which wastes compute. Secondly, it doesn't matter if your image is a great big canvas with lots of details, or it's a very simple CIFAR image or something uh, with very little detail. You have the same number of pixels, and sort of you process the same number of pixels for every single image, which seems suboptimal. Um, third. Pre-processing is an important part of training vision models. For those who train vision models, will be very familiar with that. And you're limited in how flexible you can be in your pre-processing, because the output of the pre-processing always needs to be an image of the same size for every image in your batch. And finally, and this is specific to transformers, but vision transformers are, are quite widely used now, you tie your sequence length to, once you've selected your resolution you're going to train at and your patch size, you're stuck with that sequence length, even if a different sequence length would somehow be more efficient for training. And so we have patch and pack 
uh, is a solution for this, and it's very simple. The idea is to use the same mechanisms used in NLP of the mechanism of example packing, but the analog use the analog for vision. So it works as follows. You have your images that come in all kinds of different sizes. You next apply the patchify operation. So this is the same as the vision transformers and all subsequent uh, works to that is you divide it up into these visual words where each visual word is a 16 by 16 patch or 14 by 14 patch of pixels and that seems to work quite well. You can then apply whatever pre-processing you like to these patches. And the most popular one is the drop tokens. This gives you some uh, regularization effect as well as safe and compute and not processing too many redundant tokens, which you can do in vision, not so much in language. But then, then instead of packing all your examples on the batch dimension, you pack them on the sequence dimension. So you create one sequence out of your visual examples and pad it out some fixed length, whatever length you it is you want to process. Then in your architecture, you need to make a couple of small changes. So you need to make sure that you, in your self-attention layers, image one is not attending to image two and vice versa. And then you appropriately pool the output representations such that you make independent predictions uh, for each image. Now, this is a little bit of pain to add to your visual processing mod model, but really not, not a lot. And once it's done, there's a large amount of benefit. So firstly, you don't have any of these um, seeming disadvantages uh, from the sort of standard fixed 224 by 224 setup. And the consequence of that is you get greatly increased training and serving efficiency. The model is more general. And maybe more philosophically, it sort of uh, provides another step of convergence between the um, training pipelines for vision and language. You know, the adop adoption of, of transformers was one step, but there's still this discrepancy a bit in pre-processing and, and this sort of uh, closes the gap even further between these two modalities. So some results on training efficiency. The main benefit here is that one can train much faster. So we trained a model that we call NAVIT, or native VIT, because it's trained on images with their native resolution. And um, for different sizes of VIT and NAVIT, so VIT in blue, standard vision transformer, pretty well optimized setup, it's our best setup, and the NAVIT in orange, um, you can get to the same level of accuracy both in pre-training and in transfer with four to five times uh, less compute, you know, from B up to L scale. Um, so this is great. You know, it's great to have your model. In fact, you don't get uh, 5x faster uh, every day. To dig a little bit into where these benefits are coming from, one of the things that Navit enables one to do is train on both low and high resolution images. So there's a tension between these two if you have to pick. So if you're doing fixed resolution training um, and you pick a low resolution, this is good because you end up with a smaller sequence length and therefore you can train faster and you can see more images and seeing more images is good as seeing more sentences is good in language. But if you train instead on high resolution images, this allows you to evaluate at high resolution. If you only see small resolution images and you try and evaluate at high resolution, it doesn't work too well. Um, and evaluating at high resolution generally performs better because you see more pixels and you also effectively apply more compute to the image. And with uh, example packing, one can get the benefit of seeing a lot of images while also seeing a few high resolution images, enough to allow you to evaluate at high resolution. So this uh, figure is a little bit complicated, but I'll take you through it. Um, if, if you don't follow, then uh, uh, it doesn't matter for the rest of the presentation. Um, but this demonstrates the point. So in each panel, we're evaluating at a different resolution. And on the x-axis, we have the maximum training resolution. And so for the VIT, that is just the training resolution. Uh, and for the NAVIT, we train all resolutions up to that resolution. And so if we look, for example, at the panel marked 224 res eval, these are models evaluated at 224 by 224 resolution. And the pink arrow sort of indicates the evaluation resolution. The blue VIT works when evaluated at 224 by 224 but its performance tails off very quickly when you evaluate on other resolutions. 
However, the Navet's seen already a few different resolutions at training time, so generalizes much better to both smaller and larger resolutions. And so um, if we look at the best evaluation resolution for any of these models, so you sweep over evaluation resolutions, picking the best uh, for any training resolution, then Navit dominates the, uh, the, the vision transformer, particularly at high resolution when the standard VIT just doesn't see enough images. A consequence of this is that you can get greater uh, inference speed uh, at test time because you can reduce a bit the resolution of your images, retain most of your accuracy while keeping, uh, while, while reducing the, 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 the inference cost a lot. If you try and do that with a standard vision transformer, then, then your performance tails off very, very quickly, but uh, not so much with the Navit. Okay, so this is great. Um, uh, the Navit gives one uh, a sort of a uh, big improvement in, in efficiency. Um, but there's still a cost of making these models larger and larger. Right? It gives you 5x, but that's, that's a constant, and you know, that it doesn't change the sort of underlying sort of scaling laws in, in some sense. It's still like a, as the model, the Navit gets bigger, it still gets more expensive. Okay, and this has clearly has you know, consequences. It has cost to training and serving large models, some of which are detailed in this paper. And you know, one thing this paper points out is sort of the ob obvious fact, perhaps, that uh, larger models require more flops to train. This is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, of course, due to all the scaling laws work. And it's not just training costs, but they also cost more to serve. But you know, the, the correlation is not perfect. There's these, this, these models sort of down in this corner are some very large models in terms of capacity or parameter count, sort of a proxy for capacity. Um, but they're not much more expensive to train. So, so why is that? Uh, these are the mixture of expert models that probably most people have heard of, but just in case uh, you don't know, uh, just do a quick recap. They've been around for a number of years. And they're somewhat popular, but not, not super popular for, for some reasons maybe I'll describe shortly. And the idea is that you have these layers um, where your, your word, when your word goes to that layer, rather than processing that word with every single parameter of the layer, the layer is split up into these experts, and the word is only processed by one or two of the experts at a time, either the granularity of the word or maybe the granularity of the whole sentence, or in the case of vision, your, your visual word, your patch. And this means that, in principle, it has a very nice property that you can arbitrarily a scale number of parameters and, and capacity of the model without changing either the, the training or inference cost. However, in practice, there's quite a number of challenges with training these networks. Um, the fundamental sort of challenge, I think, comes from the fact that you have this discrete switch in here. You have this gating network that makes a discrete choice of which experts to send a particular word to. And this is difficult to train with, with backpropagation. Um, there's some practical challenges as well when training such models on hardware accelerators. One wants to have typically fixed shapes, um, uh, which means that you want to send roughly the same number of words to each expert. And um, there's also a statistical efficiency. If your, all your words go to one expert, then you're not making use of that capacity. And what this typically results in is the requirement to have all kinds of auxiliary losses that you need to balance to make sure you don't drop tokens or overflow one expert while not using another, which is quite finicky. And so one empirical finding is that this routing um, is barely better than some kind of random routing, um, you know, which indicates that you know, you're underutilizing this, this additional capacity. So the idea in this work uh, is to go from these sparse design of mixture of experts to a more soft mixture of experts. So what is the soft mixture of experts? So on the um, figure on the left, sparse MOE, this is sort of another way of viewing the, the figure from, from Shazir et al. This is another view of the sparse mixture of experts. One could think of it as having these expert layers, the, the rows, and associated to each row are these slots and you want to fill these slots with tokens through hard assignment. 
And so in the case for vision, each patch gets hard assigned to one of these slots, and then each uh, expert processes uh, it's, uh, the slots that have been pre-assigned to it. Okay? And then you know, it's just another view of the same like switching network that we saw before. But with this view, it's a relatively it's a trivial extension, conceptually, to say, well, instead of making this hard assignment, we'll make a soft assignment, where each slot is going to accept a weighted average of all the input tokens, so all the input patches uh, in the case of vision. Then each expert is going to process all those slots. And then on output, we're going to sort of unmix the slots back into the original tokens. Um, so this is a sort of generalization of the standard sparse mixture of expert setup. But it has some very nice properties. So first, it's fully differentiable. Your gradients flow through the experts into the, routing, the soft routing module, which is not true for your typical sparse mixture of experts, which sort of gets gradients in a very sort of roundabout way, uh, which is why they're hard to train. By construction, you have no token dropping or expert imbalance. You fix your number of slots per expert. Uh, you balance that at the start, and um, you can't have the, there's no need for auxiliary losses, that kind of thing. Um, there's some implementational advantages when you don't have these discrete sort of top K operations that crop up in sparse mixture of experts that are sometimes slow on, on hardware accelerators. Then you can really utilize this uh, extra capacity without incurring some practical overheads uh, when implementing. And this one's a little bit of a detail, but for those who work with a mixture of expert models, it's actually kind of an important detail. With MOEs, you can have tokens from one sentence. Um, if, if you have an overflow on your experts, then, then, and, and you have too many tokens going to, to one expert, then you start dropping tokens. Uh, and what this means is some tokens from your batch can preempt uh, other tokens from other elements of your batch, so, you, so you're not necessarily deterministic. Um, uh, for, each, uh, for each sentence or, or each image. Uh, so you, but you don't get this preempting in, in the soft mixture of experts case. So this is the architecture diagram. I, I won't go through it. It's, it's kind of um, interesting. There's a, you know, there's a bunch of ablations. It's, it's quite simple, uh, but there are some details uh, in it that, that make it work. But that's something to either check the paper out or, or go through offline. Essentially, you have this module that provides this, these dispatch weights that allow you to do this mixing into slots, uh, and also these combined weights that unmixes the slots back into the tokens. But otherwise, everything is uh, as this sort of high-level diagram that I presented before. So how does it work? So these are the training Pareto frontiers. So you have the training cost on the x-axis, performance on the y-axis, transfer learning, uh, pre-training, and transfer learning. And the dense in red is your standard uh, vision transformer, quite well-optimized setup. And your, the standard sparse MOEs are orange and green. There's two flavors, expert's choice and token's choice. They perform about the same. And both perform a little bit better than, than Vision Transformer. And actually, that little bit's not, not completely trivial. We, we have a, a paper on, on that, that little bit. Um, but the soft mix of experts is clearly a long way above um, both of these um, and, and, and the dense transformer. And so, you know, we're getting like, you know, for any amount of training time, you know, plus 2% or so um, on, uh, on, on JFT and, and maybe more on transfer. And you know, these, how big is that? I mean, this is about the same performance improvement as we got when we went from ResNets to transformers. So you know, it's a similar order of magnitude uh, improvement. So uh, this is quite nice. Um, but actually, training is not necessarily what mixture of experts are really optimized for, because what they're really optimized for is having a huge network that you serve sparsely to reduce uh, inference cost. Oh, just as an addendum, this is, this is not theoretical flop. So if Jonathan's in the audience, it's not just a Pareto frontier, but it's a Pareto frontier with dollars on the x-axis, uh, in effect. Um, so you know, if, if, if we look now at inference cost, so the models plotted here, um, 
I mentioned it, the, the, the training cost, so it's not like we train the mixture of experts models way longer, and that's where the gains come from. The, the largest vision transformer on these plots is actually trained a bit more than, than the, uh, the largest um, soft mixture of experts model. But nonetheless, we get, yeah, over, over five times improvement in terms of uh, evaluation speed uh, on TPUs. And I strongly expect that will transfer to GPUs. Um, uh, compared to, um, yeah, equivalent performing uh, vision transformers, both, again, in pre-training uh, and, and in transfer. So I'll just finish with a, a little bit uh, of analysis. Um, it's, it's hard to, with deep learning, to say exactly why some methods work. But, you know, some, some nice properties that seem to, to go along, alongside the model that sort of give an indication uh, or sort of correlate with the fact that it works. Um, so, yeah, this plot uh, t takes a little bit of passing, so I'll just go through it. We have uh, three heat maps, and uh, the, the heat is the accuracy, so lighter is, is more accurate. And the soft mixture experts is, is on the left, and then we have sort of two styles of sparse mixture experts on the right. And each row corresponds to a number of tokens sent to each expert, um, which is equivalent to the number of slots. And so as you go down the rows, you get models that are more and more expensive in terms of flops. The columns are the number of experts. So in principle, the cost of the model is independent of the number of experts. It's just about the capacity, about the total number of parameters. And what we can observe is that for any model cost in terms of flops, the best performing soft MOE is the one with the most experts, which is kind of how it should be. You know, you add more parameters, it should, it should get better. It at least shouldn't get worse. But with sparse MOEs, uh, we were never able to get this. Performance, at some point, the performance starts to tail off as challenges to train those, those sparsity levels outweighs the fact that you have this extra capacity. Now, in these plots, this is actually the um, training step time. And as you see, you go down the rows, the models get more expensive in terms of training steps. But as you go across the columns on the sparse mixture of experts, it's roughly constant step time, independently of the number of experts. Whereas with the sparse MOEs, um, you know, at least with our inter implementation, which is it's quite uh, carefully done, I'd say, um, you do get a, a decrease in speed as you increase the number of experts, as well as a decrease in performance at, at some point. So it's another kind of nice property. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. Um, you know, uh, one component of building general purpose of LLMs is being able to see, and so scalable pre-training of vision uh, is very useful for that, and I've presented a couple of techniques. This patch and pack Navit, uh, and a soft mixture of experts that uh, we've been developing to, to improve this, this visual pre-training. Um, and yeah, thanks very much to the, the team uh, here in Zurich, Zurich and, and across Europe uh, with, with whom we work. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, Neil. Questions? 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 Don't be shy. I have one, but I don't want to steal the time, so we go with Arnie. So, um, when you have a sparse mixture of experts at inference time, it can be extremely efficient. But when you have soft, you're using every expert for every patch? So, from the patch's point of view, yes. But from a computational point of view, no. But it's sparse with respect to the slots. So each slot sees every patch. But each slot only goes to one expert. So it's the same in flops as a sparse mixture of expert. But you know, th those slots see fractionally every patch. So, so yeah, fr from, the, from, indeed, from, from the, the patch's point of view, it's not really a sparse network. But from the actual computation being run, uh, it, it is sparse.